Hey guys, JJ here, back again for another Wednesday of Zoom Networking. Today's guest speaker is an absolutely awesome young man. Had a chance to talk to him, never enough, but a bit to get acquainted before a call. Um, just a great guy. He comes from a city that has a football team known for winning. Uh, he's from the New England area. They have a basketball team that's known for winning. Uh, and their baseball team's known for winning. And their hockey team's known for winning. And this guy's known for winning. Uh, we're out of the same education group, sub two. Uh, just a really nice young man. He's going to talk to us about comping and, and underwriting. And um, my good friend, Mr. Ryan Erico. Ryan, how are you, my friend? Doing awesome, JJ. How's it going? Going good, brother. Um, I love your topic today. Boy, comping and underwriting, nothing more important than that. You know, we could, we, we need to understand how to underwrite deals, which is really important. Hey, so this team with the basketball team, the football team, the baseball team, and the hockey team, for those who don't know you, where in the country are you located? I'm over in uh, Boston, Mass. Uh, if you couldn't tell from all those winning teams, uh, you know, I got Fenway Park over here in the background. So uh, we got uh, Gillette over here. So you know what's up. There you go. Yeah, I've been to Fenway, um, one of the 13 ballparks around the country that I have been to. Beautiful out there. Beautiful. I've been to Cape Cod and have family in the Boston area. So, um, hey, let me ask you, what did you do before you became a real estate investor? Uh, so I was, so I graduated uh, college and then I uh, didn't really know what I was going to do uh, 100%. Uh, I knew my dad had been in real estate for uh, a long time, over 30 years. Uh, I hadn't really given it any thought, but then, um, at, you know, after graduating, I kind of decided that it might be something I was interested in. So he helped me get a job doing appraisal work. Uh, and that's what I did for three years. So I got a lot of great experience um, at a, a third generation uh, appraisal uh, office out of Arlington, Mass. Um, my boss knew, knew his stuff and it was just like a waterfall of information that I was able to uh, get access to. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was just awesome. I mean, he was actually, he actually did do an appraisal on Fenway at one point. Um, so he's like a legit dude. And, um, I'm hoping to share some of the information that I, some of the techniques that I got, uh, from him and, uh, kind of, uh, talk about that sort of stuff. Wow, brother. That's, that is awesome. Hey, so I met you through the sub two community. How long have you been in Pace's, uh, mentorship? So I, I did uh, a full year of appraisal before deciding that I was going to try to start doing some uh, deals. And then I got in about uh, two years ago. So I've been in probably two, two and a half years ago. I'm coming up on my third year. Um, so I've been in it for a while. Um, I've managed to uh, learn a bunch uh, and, and start doing some deals. So I feel very lucky to be able to do that. Good for you. Good for you, brother. Hey, so let's, let's jump right into this, man. Um, uh, where do you want to start? Appraisals and underwriting. Uh, let me ask you this. We got people on the call that are new investors and watching on YouTube weeks and months down the line. We'll have more new mm -hmm. investors. What is is comping and what is yep. underwriting? Is there a difference? Yep. So, I mean, it depends on who you ask, I think. But for me, that there is a little bit of a difference. Uh, I just like to separate them in my head because I think that there's a little bit more involved when it comes to underwriting. Uh, and just so we're all on the same page, I'm talking about uh, residential uh, units, one through one through four unit buildings. Uh, anything past that is a little bit different of a, a ball game. You know, I'm, I'm, it, you can you can look at it like a commercial thing. Uh, that's not really that's not really my expertise. Um, so if you had a question about that, that's not really uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about single families, duplexes, uh, tries and quads. And for me, you know, it all comes down to uh, what we're trying to do is derive an opinion of value. Right. So there is, you know, there's a price. There's something that some, there's something that someone will pay for something and has paid for something. Uh, and then there's value, which is kind of uh, more theoretical. And I'm going to try to, you know, get get to that number as objectively as I can, right? Using data and uh, looking for consistency in data. So when I'm talking about the difference between comping and underwriting, the only difference is, is like how much data I'm looking at and how quickly I'm going through the data to be able to get to the opinion of value that I'm looking for. 
Now, when when one is is going through this process, I mean, you know, a lot of people working on a project and they see a house. Oh, this really needs to work. This really needs to work for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it something one goes into with a predetermined uh, uh, objective? Do or do most Absolutely people not. do most yeah, people no, do that, so, or do or so, do you think everybody goes in with an open mind to to realize that this might not be the yeah. thing? It, if you're gonna if you're gonna be coming down and and uh, and getting attached emotionally to a property, you might as well come down to Boston. We'll go to Encore, and you can throw your money in. It'll be you know just as good odds, right? So you got to be you got to be completely uh, unbiased when you're looking at deals. I like to say kill deals quickly. Right. So like I'm a pretty conservative person. Um, you know, I haven't seen all the ways to do a deal. Right. I know how to do a deal. I, I don't know how to do every deal, but I'm good at at the deals that I know how to do. Right. So I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to look at deals. If it doesn't fit my buy box, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to get worried about um, I think I need to do this deal because it looks like, you know, the returns could be really good. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, you just mentioned a phrase, and I'm going to touch on some things. We have some very experienced people on the call, and experienced people be watching the videos to get your perspective. But, again, for those that are new, what is a buy box? Is it something like, like a – is it square, or do you go to, like, Home Depot to buy one, or – what's a buy box? Yeah. So a buy box is just a, a definition. Uh, usually, like, you can write it, put it in a Google Drive, put it in your, you know – your notes, whatever you want to do. It's something that you define your investment strategy. So, you know, for me, I'm looking for uh, flips. So I like to say, you know, in in Massachusetts, east of Worcester, north of Plymouth, at 70% of ARV minus uh, the repair cost, minus the holding cost, minus the resale cost. And that's going to give me the, the number that I'm looking for for an offer, right? So... Um, that's, that's just one thing. If you're into, you know, Airbnb, you're going to have a completely different thing. Know your, know what you're looking for. Don't get shiny object syndrome and just stay in your lane. And then once it starts working, you can start to expand. You know, I, I hear something frequently as we're talking about acquiring properties. And obviously if we're going to acquire property, we, we want to get comps on it. Mm -hmm. If we're going to acquire property, we're going to go into a transaction. We need to underwrite that transaction to make sure it's going to make mm -hmm. sense to follow through with. But um, I always hear about we need to know what our exit strategy is. Now, absolutely. How does that impact? You know what you're doing. What what we're speaking about today. How does it? Yeah. So exit strategy is a huge component of um, comping and underwriting because. Uh, depending on what your plan is with the uh, property and how you're going to exit it, uh, you should know that up front. Um, if you don't know what your plan is with the property, you can run into trouble, you can start to lose money. So in order to kind of know what you're doing, uh, you have to uh, have a strategy, right? And then I like to add some redundancy. So that exit strategy is going to be, what, what is the intention behind this property, right? Am I going to flip it? Am I going to renovate it and then hold it? Am I going to use it as an Airbnb? Am I going to, um, you know, buy a turnkey property? Uh, am I going to wrap it, right? So there's all different kinds of exit strategies that you want to uh, be aware of. And uh, you don't want to, if you're, if you're uh, newer, you want to pick one and get good at it and then, you know, add new things on later. So it, it sounds like that basically knowing what you want to do with it, that as you find your comps and you analyze the deal or underwrite the deal, the process of comping and analyzing or underwriting will indeed confirm for you if your desired exit strategy is reasonable or rational. Is that correct? Exactly. And so, you know, you can, you can comp something uh, in, in one context of an exit strategy where um, let's say I'm going to do a flip and I do my underwriting, uh, and it's not a deal. But in the same, in this, with the same deal at the same price, it might be a deal if I want to hold it. So these things start to matter when you're looking at um, what your what your exit strategy is. Well, cool. hey, we seem to have a question here in the crowd. 
Yeah, I was just wondering how you determine your exit strategy. Do you have to get the exit strategy first before you look at the property or? That's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and so, yes, I, I think that you should have an exit strategy in mind. And what for me, exit strategy, what you should be uh, kind of thinking about when you're thinking about an exit strategy uh, is um, what you're good at and your risk tolerance. So if, if you know, like maybe you have a background in construction or maybe you, um, what is it? I'm, I'm pretty good with handy stuff. Handy man. A exactly. Okay. So then maybe you're more inclined to, to do flipping because you know, that kind of stuff, right? You might be able to look at something and say, uh, this is going to, this is going to cost X amount of dollars for a rehab. Whereas somebody else, you know, maybe they come from a hospitality background. Uh, they worked in hotels or something. And they want to do Airbnb as their, um, you know, primary exit strategy. Mm -hmm. So that, so what you're good at is one thing. And then also your risk tolerance, because sometimes, you know, you're looking at one exit strategy and it can be, uh, it can seem a lot more risky than another one, but those kind of feed to each other because uh, the more, you know, something, the less risky it's going to be for it. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on exit strategy, but uh, you know, I've heard that we talk about, you know, oh, I want to do a short term rental because with a short term rental, I can make more money, you know, mm -hmm. running it for a short term rental. But again, if the short term rental doesn't work out, you know, then your only strategy really is a long term rental. So I don't know how this applies to comping, but is it true that you really have to evaluate it most of the time that if, if it can't make sense as a long-term rental it's it's not going to make sense as a short-term rental is that hold so, any so so what i like to look for in a deal is uh redundancy so when i when i went to college i actually didn't study uh things related to real estate i went for uh adventure education and we learned about uh kind of outdoor based activities learning um, and how to like manage yourself in, uh, that environment, you know, in the outdoor environment, we talk a lot about risk and the, uh, risk is the same in that context as in this context, when you go rock climbing, it, if you go climbing, you want to have two anchors, right? Because if one fails, you want to make sure you want to make sure that your, uh, your second one's there to catch you, right? Yeah. You don't want to be caught with no anchor and fall down 30 feet to the ground, right? So the same idea applies to real estate where you want to have redundancy if you can in your exit strategy. So if I look at a deal and I say, all right, I'm going to flip this. Uh, what happens if there's a shift in the market and uh, it, then the interest rates go up and I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose a bunch of money if I uh, try to sell this deal? Can I rent this and still make, you know, can I still get by, right? It's not going to be a killer deal anymore, but, but am I going to lose money? Right. Or in the context of the short term rental, the medium term rental, you want to see that 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 works as a long term rental, because what if you get in there and you realize, oh, man, like this is way, way different than I thought. Uh, you know, this market doesn't like short term rentals. A bunch of municipalities are coming in and putting in regulations. So what happens if uh, your town says, hey, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Right. So you don't want to be stuck with a property that's hemorrhaging money. Uh, if it's not going to be able to rent at the uh, long-term rate mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, no, awesome. Hey, um, you really sound like you know your stuff. As, you, as you've gotten into this aspect of real estate investment, uh, and again, I know you said you work with somebody in particular. Um, was there like, was that the one primary person that was your mentor? Did you have a couple people to help you kind of blaze this trail or, or, or lead you down the way? I mean, I could tell you're a sharp guy and you know your stuff, but, you know, did somebody kind of make it a little easier or kind of kind of help you along the way in, in your in your growth? I've been absolutely blessed with mentors. Uh, you know, being a part of Sub2, I think, has just absolutely uh, skyrocketed my learning curve. Um, having access to people, it's like you were talking about at the beginning of the uh, call, you know, being able to tug on someone's shirt um and just be like hey you know what's going on here am i doing what's why am i why am i messing up like what's going what, how can i do this better um you know and then i'm i'm extremely blessed to have my father uh who's been doing this for 35 years and is kind of always able to help me and 
you know, give me good guidance. Um, but in terms of, you know, sub two, uh, New England has a, had a, a great uh, local community. Um, we, you know, we meet every Thursday night and there's a ton of information being exchanged. Justin Tumanowski is an amazing guy. He helped me get a couple of my uh, deals when I was really struggling. So, um, you know, a lot of great people in this community and, and it's, it's important to take advantage of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, having the right people around us is, is just key to our success. Um, you know, I, I hear, and you talk about underwriting, you're in the Boston community that, you know, some parts of the country, the predominant blue States, Los Angeles or cities, Chicago, San Francisco, New York, Boston, these sometimes aren't really great places to do real estate investment, but apparently if one knows their numbers and knows how to, you know, find the, find the right comps and underwrite that uh, even the, the more challenging cities can, can be um, um, profitable. Yeah. hundred percent. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, you just have to know your market. And um, as long as you are uh, not, not getting emotional about it and not getting impatient about it, uh, the right deal will come along. The benefit of being in a market like this is that, you know, a deal is going to be a lot bigger. Um, so you don't have to be doing as many to get, um, you know, a bigger deal come along. Um, that's, I think, a big benefit of this market. And now that I know how to do it here, I feel like I can do it anywhere because it is a little bit harder. Uh, the houses are are uh, inconsistent. Um, and like I said, you know, the, the consistency in data is what really allows you to be confident and certain in your decision making. So if you're working with uh, inconsistent data, you have to start to, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper. Um, but once you start to know how to do that, uh, when you go to a place where every house is carbon copy, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy. So, so when I talk about comping, you know, I said it, it's typically like a shorter, like I'm trying to kill my deal um, and get it off my desk. Right. So I want to just look at something at face value. Um, actually it looks like we have a, a hand raised here. I don't know if we want to address that real quick. Yeah. Let's, let's bring this young man in here. My good friend, Troy Caudell, killing it across the Midwest. Troy, you're on with Ryan Erica. What's your question? I just had a quick question. Uh, what would you recommend towards somebody to kind of expedite the underwriting? I was like, cause that's where I kind of have a lot of time tied up is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. underwriting each deal. It just seems and comping. Mm -hmm. It just seems to take a lot more time than what some other people. Yeah, a hundred percent. And th this is a great segue because this is kind of what I was going to talk about uh, with the separation of comping and, uh, and underwriting, because I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend a bunch of time uh, looking at deals that don't go anywhere because um, you know, I'm, I'm a busy guy. I want to make sure that I'm getting through a bunch of deals and that's how I'm going to find the uh, good one. So, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm comping, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, I'm trying to do napkin math. I'm just trying to get the, the general idea and see how close it lines up to my, uh, to my buy box. Scott, you are on with Ryan and Erica. What's your question? Hey, Ryan. Hey, yeah. I, um, what are currently right now, what are your dates? How, how far back are your, I, know, I realize it's all driven mm -hmm. by what section of town you're in, what little town you're in. Um, yep. how hot the market is, but what's the oldest yep. comp you like to go with there on the East Coast where you're at? Great question. Um, so when I look at, um, you know, time, um, I'm typically looking in like a six month uh, time frame. If I have to go uh, back in time, um, I will. I can do that because I have a, a, a technique that I use uh, utilizing uh, Redfin that I can show everybody right now um, on how to kind of come up with a, a time adjustment um, and uh, know your market specifically. It does kind of depend on the market. It depends on how much data is available um, and also like what, uh, what the geographical location is. So, you know, I, I would recommend uh, always to check out um, Astro Flipping, the appraisal guidelines, because Jamil uh, interviewed hundreds of appraisers and kind of determined 
a um, uh, the most common practice on how to do comping. Uh, and I follow a lot of those guidelines. Some of them are a little bit different for depending on the market you're in. Um, but he says, you know, you want to you want to go further out in uh, location uh, before you have to go back. Up. So if you have to go a little bit further out, um, but if you're you know, if you know the market and you know, like you're, you, you shouldn't be crossing like this major road. Right. Because on one side, it's a completely different neighborhood. Uh, than this other side, then you're going to, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be using properties from that other side of the road, even though they're only a half mile away or less. Right. So then in that case, I'm going to go back in time to try to find properties that are, um, you know, a little bit more comparable. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, cause if you look at every state and certain states like here in Texas, uh, they, they hold back information unless you pay, unless you're right, a right. professional and you pay for, data right right so then but other states have a lot of information and then it depends right. you know texas is hot other places are the market's super soft so you are slow you know so mm -hmm. you just have to look so six months is your is your cutoff it, right that's general, what i typically look at because so and, and this goes into a, a broader thing um here whereas i want to start with the most amount of data that i can get and then funnel it down into a specific thing Right. I don't want to I don't want to count out data uh, right away because I think that it might be, you know, too far back in time or too far away in location. Um, I don't want to make that decision until I, I see the full picture. So I'm going to I'm going to take a really broad I'm going to I'm going to look at, at, at a big time set. I'm going to look at a big and this is gets more into the underwriting side of things, but still applies to comping. Um, I'm going to take a big data set. And then I'm going to filter it down. I have my I have stages that I process the data through to get to uh, my opinion or value. David Bradley, you're on with Ryan Erica. What's your question? Hi, Ryan. So I was looking at some properties recently in Orange County in Southern California, and mm -hmm. you talked about. And I follow um, the same rules that were put out. Basically, the one that kind of threw me though is, and that I don't typically follow when I'm doing underwriting and doing comping is some of the developments in those areas, they did developments across major roads. And so the same mm -hmm. development is being done on both sides at the same mm -hmm. time or within a couple of months. Are you still holding fast to that kind of a rule? Or are you looking a little bit low below that to make sure that they're comparable properties in the comparable build time frame and the comparable yeah. builder kind of thing? Yeah. So this is, this is why uh, comping and underwriting is complicated because right. – there is like there's a there there's a scientific objective element to it that you want to adhere to as much as you can, but okay. you don't want to you don't want to let that box you in if you know a market. So if you okay. know something and you know that these properties are highly comparable, then that's okay. Um, but if you aren't aware of it, so these these are the, the these guidelines are are there to protect people from making bad decisions, but that doesn't mean that they're the end all be all. Right. So, okay. Right. If you know if you know that that that's the case, then you can kind of you know make a judgment call on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for your question, my friend. Good to see you. No worries. Thank you, uh, Scott. You're on with Ronnie Erica. What's your question? Thanks, JJ and Ryan. Um, I'm I, I have the basics. I think pretty good grasp on comps and underwriting until it gets into the ARV stuff. So that's where mm -hmm. the math gets a little fuzzier for me. And I know that's getting a little more complicated. But if you have any insights, at least from a starting high level yep. viewpoint on yep. the ARV side, that'd be great. So great question. Um, when you're looking at ARV, uh, you obviously want to look at uh, properties that have already been, uh, you know, redone if they're available. So that's not always true, right? And you want to match the style. So you you can't be taking a ranch and comparing it to uh, a colonial and think that they're they're that they're the same. It's apples and oranges. You have to you have to compare like kind. So when I'm looking at, let's say it's a ranch and I'm trying to uh, figure out the ARV, you know, I'm going to look for other ranches that have recently been redone in that area 
and then though that data right that's that's the past uh, information and that there's my consistency. The consistency is going to give me the certainty that I need. The more of those properties that exist, the more consistency in the data, the more confident and certain I can be, the lower the risk. So that's, that's the one way that you can do it. But then the problem comes up is, you know, what happens if there's no properties that have been redone in this market? Right. So how can I make a, a, a judgment uh, to, to look at this and say, what, what, what could possibly be my ARV? So when, when this happens, I do a couple things and I just want to you know preface this by saying that now you're starting to enter a, a different territory of a little bit higher risk. So there's less consistency in the data. You're starting to make more judgments and that's going to, that's going to increase the risk factor. So it depends on your risk tolerance. So if you have a higher risk tolerance, you're confident, you know your market, then that's one thing. But if you're unsure, then this might be something that you want to, you know, um, take with a, a grain of salt and, you know, look for something with a little bit more consistency behind. But what I'll do is basically I'll take a, a snapshot of market as a whole and I'll say, you know, what's the minimum, what's the smallest uh, sold price in this market and what's the highest? And then that's my range between the smallest and the highest. So I know for certain that the ARV cannot will not be higher than the highest sold property in that market. Now I can start making judgments about my property, about where it is, the size, all of the different factors and say, where does it fall in the spectrum? And where do I realistically, unbiasedly, you know, I have to be I have to be very honest with myself. Where do I think it falls in the spectrum? And I can also additionally, I have an adjustment table that I use and I can make um, simulated adjustments uh, based on the condition to kind of derive uh, an ARV uh, or a potential range on what I think it could potentially be when the, uh, you know, the, the, the data isn't there that can tell me that. And then... Um, Going into the scope of work stuff is a whole nother thing. I mean, are you relying on your own abilities to evaluate someone's scope of work? Are you using, you know, external contractor relationships yeah. to yeah. dig into the due so, diligence? I know we're going into the weed right. here. Yeah, admittedly, that is something that um, I, I need to learn more about. I have, you know, been around it, so I have general ideas and uh kind of know what things cost uh it's a little bit market specific but the guidelines from astro are great i think that they're very um consistent all you have to do is google uh astro appraisal rules and it'll pop up one of the first images um and but i do have a strategy based on percentages that i use to kind of make projections in my adjustments and we can kind of uh talk about that and get into that i wanted to show people uh, my adjustment table and uh, kind of run through it real quick. Um, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about comping, it's usually a five to 15 minute uh, thing. When I'm talking about underwriting, we're now talking about two to three hours. So there's a lot more involved um, and kind of getting into uh, those adjustments can give you a lot of confidence, but it's, it has to be something that you're pretty confident in. Maybe you already have a contract. Maybe you're already, uh, you know, put an offer out and they're considering it. Uh, that's when I choose to start to underwrite something. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Scott, thanks for joining us today, my friend. Thank you. Gosh, this is incredible. Like I put in the chat, it's like uh, I'm at an international meetup here and I didn't have to drive anywhere, put any pants on or anything. This is great. <laughs> there you go. You've got people from all over the country here. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Troy, you got your, got that address for us? Hey, you just want me to say it or you want me to put it in the side chat? You can throw it in the chat. That might be a little bit easier. Thank you. Yeah, then, then uh, Ryan can copy and paste and go from there. All right. So first thing that I'm going to do is um, I'm going to get an idea of the uh, – I like to look at the uh, the matrix. So the matrix for me is the bed-bath count. Uh, it's just a fancy way of saying that. Um, the bed-bath count is um, – so I'll pull up – so I'll do a couple things. I'm going to open up a Zillow um, – the, uh, the Zillow – or Redfin or wherever um, on this uh, property so that I can kind of get a little bit of information based on this. Um, 
the thing that uh, the thing that I want to say about this is that this this information is mostly accurate, but not always. So you want to try to get the accurate information if you can. Um, I don't always uh, look for the accurate info until I'm underwriting. Um, so I'm just going to like, I'm, I'm going to comp this based on the uh, Zillow information. And then if it qualifies it at this, at these numbers, then, uh, then I can look into it and, and check it out and see if it's legit. Um, so the way that I do that is by opening up the property card. Um, I know it's a little bit more difficult in places like Texas where some of that information is limited. Um, but for the most part, a lot of places are going to have that. So then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this map. Um, and I'm going to start looking for what I call yeah buts. So yeah buts are, this could be a great deal. And you say, yeah, but, um, you know, it's next to um, a major highway or it's, you know, directly next to a commercial location. Um, or, you know, there's some sort of um, environmental, um, you know, issue or something that's going along with that. Right. So there's there's um, sort of sort of like red flags that you have to be looking out for. Uh, and a lot of them can be seen from a map. Right. So other ones can't. Um, around here, we have septic tanks that are often failed and can cost, you know, 50 to 70 thousand dollars. So that can absolutely blow up your deal if you're not asking the right questions about a septic tank um, or, or something along those lines. So there's all these kind of things that you have to know market specific. Uh, that could blow up your deal um, and just be kind of wary of uh, these things that that are are red flags and um, can can kind of impact the value. So the first thing I notice is that this highway is here. Um, you know, these properties that are right along uh, the edge here, these are going to be impacted. These, the, the value of these properties is going to be impacted. Now, over here, you know, it's a little bit removed. There's a couple rows of houses in the way, um, you know, it. it it might, it might be okay. I think that that's probably far enough away that um, you're probably still going to hear the highway, but I don't know if it's going to be a major a difference in value. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly look in here and check out the neighborhood and just get a, a feel for the uh, feel for the neighborhood. Um, you know, just be mindful of something, you know, down here, it says image capture October, 2015. So that's just something to be mindful of when you're looking at these, because a lot can happen in nine years. Uh, you know, 20 and uh, 2019 over here is a little bit, a um, little bit more recent. But, you know, there could have been some developments that that happened uh, in that time that you're not aware of that may, you know, um, you know, increase the increase the value, decrease the value. But this is going to give you a general idea of the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you can see, you know, somebody sent me a deal one time and it made sense. It made perfect sense at face value. Uh, but I was like, why is he having trouble uh, selling it? And then uh, I looked in at the maps and I turn around and then there's like this massive, ugly, abandoned commercial property directly across the street. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's why um, this this deal is is no good. Right. So those can have a massive impact on value. Um, so I just want to get an idea. Now, this one doesn't have it, which makes things kind of uh, a little bit more difficult. But typically there's going to be pictures here. So this is going to give you an idea of the uh, condition. Um, but when there's not, uh, what you can do is, uh, I'll just go back and make sure I'm at the uh, right address here. Um, I'm not really sure which one it, it, it is, but what you can kind of default to and make assumptions about just to keep the, just to keep the ball rolling is look at the exterior of the property. So you can make assumptions about the interior of the property based on the exterior of the property. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be super accurate, but it's going to give you sort of like a, a frame that you can work off to keep the to keep the thing moving and, and make sure that you're uh, um, able to continue looking at the deal. So, you know, there's some some wear and tear, you know, it's not like I, I'm assuming it's this one and not this one, but let's just say it's this one, um, you know, the. Uh, the the um, foundation is 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 painted here, but you know it's it looks like the deck's a little bit older. There's some stuff going on over here. Um, you know it's it's not a brand new property by any means, but it's also not like completely dilapidated and like uh, falling apart. So you know you can start to make some assumptions about what's going on here. It's probably you know they got they got little flower pots outside. 
the uh, landscaping looks like it's fairly together. Um, so all these like little, um, you know, little things add up. You got this little painted fence here. Somebody is is uh, caring for this property to some degree. So you know the inside of it uh, will probably reflect that, um, and it's probably a rental grade uh, interior. It's probably not something uh, super fancy, um, but it's also probably not destroyed either. So that's kind of how I make my assumptions about the the condition. And then from there, I, I, you know, I'm going to identify the, uh, the property type. So, you know, single family home with four bedrooms, one bathroom, two stories with uh, with the attic space looking like. So this is a this to me is a colonial. Um, can't really get a good look at it with these trees. Um, but this is probably, this is probably a colonial single family. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into Zillow because, um, this is simple. I, I would, you know, if you don't have MLS access, I recommend PropStream. Uh, PropStream is pretty good for, uh, finding information about comps, but you can definitely do it in Zillow, uh, if you need to. Um, so what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to try to find the, uh, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start by um, looking for comps. So I'm just gonna grab a uh, a circle here. When I do this, when I'm underwriting, um, you can you can get a little bit more broad. But for this, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, start to look within like a selected range. So once I kind of have like you know uh, maybe a mile um, uh, around the subject property, then I'm gonna go ahead and start to filter by my matrix. So it's a uh, four bed. Uh, one bath and uh, I can go ahead and apply this and I'm going to deselect these so that we're only looking at um, houses and then you can start to you can come in here and and what I like to do for the uh, square foot range is uh, um, maybe like 10 or 15 percent so if the uh, the subject property is yeah so 4,000 square feet so this is actually this is actually a, a pretty big um property so we'll see what there is for comps here but i might go down to um 3500 and we'll go up to 5000 okay so so th this is this this is where we start to see you know there's only one property here that um is is comparable and the issue is that it it has four bathrooms so it's good to know what's on market i like to get an idea of kind of what's going on so you can see like this one okay this one's not selling they had a price cut this um you know yesterday uh maybe it's been on market for a month uh, and it's not going um you know that might indicate that that um that price is too high so that's something to consider when you're looking at um what what's happening on, with things that haven't sold yet so that's also uh something to look at but we want to look at what's been sold so let's Let's go ahead and switch that over real quick. Okay, so we've got some more, we've got some more data here that we're able to work with. Um, is it's 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 right over here, um, so we can start to look through um, and see what's going on with the with the cops uh, in this area. So I'm not super familiar with this market, so I don't know if there's a big difference between what's going on over on this side versus over on this side versus on this side of the highway. But I just want to familiarize myself. I just want to start like looking at this and seeing uh, kind of what's going on uh, in this market. So, you know, I might I might look at something like this where you know I see okay, uh, four bed, one bath, uh, thirty eight hundred square feet. This is very close uh, to what we were looking at. And if we look at the condition, uh, you know, stairs are a little bit older, fence isn't painted, um, you know. A little bit more space in the yard. I don't know if that immediately means anything. Uh, these windows look a little bit older. Um, the condition could be similar, but also might be a little bit uh, worse. So I didn't notice if the other one had a uh, driveway, if it had parking. That's something to consider as well. Um, you know, you can see that they have a couple of decorations going on here, uh, which means it's probably not beat too badly inside. Uh, but it's probably it's probably good it's probably uh, an older uh, property. But this is something to look at and say, okay, this is this was probably um, you know a similar as is uh, number for what I'm looking at. So okay, this might be what 
somebody might pay for uh, the, the the subject property, okay? But now I'm looking up here at this one and I'm saying, okay, well, what, what happened here? All right, let's make sure that we have our uh, time set correctly because this could have this could have easily been a, a long time ago so we have to make sure let's go back six months okay all right so that actually removed a, a lot of data for us unfortunately um so that might actually be a, a, a situation where okay jamil says before you move back in time let's let's broaden the uh the uh, boundaries here so let's just go ahead and uh grab grab a little bit more of what's going on and see if there's some more information for us okay so now we've we've got all right. So this now this is different, right? So so this this property this looks like a cape, and it's got a lot of space, and it's in a, a a nicer neighborhood. These houses are definitely looking a little bit better. Things are a little bit more spread out. So you just want to be start like internalizing all this stuff um, about what's going on with the location, about all this stuff, and then kind of just kind of understanding what's going on with the price. Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're looking for stuff that's similar, okay? So this is not similar. So I wouldn't be using this as a comp. I wouldn't be looking at this as, and saying this is a comp because I'm looking for something that that is um, more related to the property that we have. I wish there was a few more pictures. Uh, makes It makes it a little bit easier when there's more pictures. Um, but, okay, so something like this. Let's see what's going on here. All right, this neighborhood is 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 fairly similar. Um, yeah, so I don't know what's going on out here, but this this place looks. So this is what I'm talking about when I when I see a property from the from the outside, I, I see this and I'm like, okay, the inside of this property is absolutely destroyed, right? So we've got trash in the gutter. You know, there's stuff on the roof. These these uh, these windows are 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 incredibly old. You know, um, and and it just looks like this property is is probably the is probably the worst one on the street, right? So maybe this is why. Um, let's go back and see. You know, okay. So I don't know if this is because it it resold or oh yeah. Okay, look, so somebody came in here and flipped this. So this is actually so this one hundred and sixty is actually going to be the ARV price of this property. Um, when we go and look at it, we can see it's a four two at thirty eight hundred. So okay, now we're kind of looking at uh, one hundred and sixty as like a potential ARV. So now I'm just familiarizing myself. I'm looking at what the market might be. So I'm going to disqualify this one because it's in a much nicer neighborhood. It's a, it's, it's a completely different situation. Uh, and I'm going to kind of look at, at the, at the uh, market with the data that I have. Okay. And I can see here that the market caps out at about 200 and I can see that I have a comp at about 160. Okay. So now I can have all this information in my head. Uh, I can start to make an assumption about the uh, ARV of the of the subject property. So when we go back here, you know, okay, so this one is about 100 square feet smaller. Uh, it's but it's got an additional bathroom. You know, now you start applying the uh, astro pumping things and start to make your adjustments at like a surface level. So like for example, you know, a bathroom, um, you know, uh, that might be it might be a, a 10k difference, right? So the bathroom could be 10K. Um, let's see, what other stuff's going on here? There's the same amount of bedrooms. I don't know if this one doesn't have a garage, looks like, doesn't have parking. Um, does the subject have that stuff? Let's see, right? So yeah, no, no parking here. Um, so we don't have to make an adjustment on that. Uh, there's no pool, there's no carport. Square footage is about the same. Uh, it's a hundred, so you know we can we can make an assumption. So you can you can you have to know your market a little bit to to be able to do this. And I want to pull this up um, real quick. But um, so Redfin has a um, data source, and let's see. Hang on, I don't want to get too deep into Redfin on the data center right now. But what I like to do also is check for the market's ability to uh, to make you know things happen, right? So the activity in the market. So I'll look at um, I'll look at at, at uh, Milwaukee here, and I'll just throw it in uh, the Redfin um, 
the Redfin housing market just to see, just to confirm, right? Because some markets, you know, so this is a, this is a healthy market. There's a lot of activity here. Um, but if I'm in a more rural location and I see that, that there's a market that's transacting with less than uh, five homes sold per month, I'm just disqualifying that deal. So that's just something to consider. It's not applicable to this one, but I just wanted to point that out because um, I've seen deals that look good, but won't sell because nobody's there to buy it. So if you are in a market where there's less than five transactions happening per month, try to move to a different market and try to look at, at deals in a different place, unless you're really, really, really familiar with the area. Um, that's just something that I like to consider always uh, with, with looking at uh, a deal. Um, but now getting back to um, when did this sell? So this sold in uh, March, okay? So let's start, let's get a little bit of an idea of what's going on with the market and, and where, where it's been and where it's going. I just want to kind of get an idea of um, like, just like, just, just, just broadly, like what, what is, what is the state of this market? So Wisconsin, and we're going to go for Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All right. So we're going to apply this. And we're going to go ahead and do single family residential. Okay. This is going to give us information on the uh, market that you're in. And you can start to uh, check out what's going on here. Um, so the data goes back pretty far. Uh, I like to go back like roughly like two years uh, to kind of check out what's going on. Uh, just to see maybe like what's what's been happening since March. Uh, and, you know, what's happened like in the previous like uh, two years of um, uh price activity, right? So for this, I like to look at the uh, the month over month change and I'll look back and I'll say, okay, oh, all right. So we have uh, seen some some appreciation um, in in the last few months, you know, since March. Um, but before that, there was a, there was a bunch of uh, decline happening, okay? So, and then, yep, before that, we had a little bit of appreciation. So this is, this is a this is a, a natural market. Uh, you can you can start to get an idea here. Uh, you can also visualize this. They have a uh, it might be back on the uh, the other page. Now you know when you get when you start to know this stuff, you can just like fly through it. So it's like I'm I'm explaining it, so it's taking a little bit longer. But when I'm doing this stuff, I, I I'm searching this stuff. It usually takes me five to five to fifteen minutes. I know my market. I kind of already don't have to look at the uh, appreciation of of a uh, of a market, but so you can all, yeah, all right. So this might be an easier way of doing it um, is come down here and you can you can actually visualize and see uh, where's what was this market doing, right? So back in 2022, it, it, it peaked, it came down, started to come back, it, it came down again. All right, now it's going back up, okay? So so it, it tends to come up in the spring, looks like. So spring, summer, this market likes to, to, to have a, a little bit more activity and then it falls off and in uh, January, December, February, um, and then it starts to come back up. Okay, so this is something you want to think about when you're, if you're going to do a flip, is when am I going to sell this thing, right? If I'm going to sell this thing, is it is it going to sell um, in in the summer when when there's a lot of activity, when the price is going up, or am I going to sell this in the winter and I have to deal with a slower market that's going to yield me less? So this is a graph that I really like to look at um and um start to make some some decisions about this so i can see that this sold in uh in march right so there's gonna there's some appreciation so if i was to sell you know if i was to sell a property right now you know it might be it could be five ten percent higher than it than it was in march this is something to consider so now i'm starting to, because i only have this one data point um you know it might be it it might be a good idea to go a little bit further back in time just to see what's going on, uh, to see if there might be something that is a little bit closer, um, just 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 to check it out. So, um, you know, I added that and okay, we get we get a couple more. All right. Um, this this is uh, from a year ago. I uh, can't really tell what's going on with the condition. It looks like it might be similar. Uh, again, there's no. There's no driveway, there's no carport, there's no garage. Um, it does look like a colonial. Um, landscaping looks okay. This is probably a pretty similar property. So, okay, so now we have a, 
a sale at 110 from a year ago, but now we've seen that this um, this area has appreciated, um, you know, five, 10 percent. So we can uh, assume that maybe this would be, you know, 120 to 130 uh, if it was to sell um, again right now. So you can add some appreciation to that. And when I'm comping, I'm just using rough numbers. I'm not getting into the weeds. I'm not being specific. I'm not uh, overthinking it. I'm just like, what what's possible here? What what is the context? How am I, you know, how can I, um, you know, make a quick judgment on this and keep things moving? So now I have two data points that I kind of like. I have, um, you know, you can also look at this one if you want, you know, but it's got four bathrooms, so it's something to consider. But you can tell from the exterior, you know, you're a little bit more beat up here. Um, you know, these aren't these have been painted. Maybe it's the worst condition. That could be why it sold. Also, it sold at 101, 100. It's just something to think about. It's like why, why did it sell at that like a at a, at a weird number? You know, maybe there was some you know uh, concession that happened here. Um, you know, so just just little things like that um, can kind of add up. Oh, and all right. So look at this. So now we, we see we've got a massive church right here. And what's across the street? This barren parking lot. Okay. So now I can start to understand. Okay. This has three more bathrooms. There should be a lot more value in there um, for someone. But now we're looking at the area. Okay. Now that we're talking about we're next to a, a parking lot, this might be a 10% adjustment, negative adjustment. And, and this might be a 10% negative adjustment. Okay. So now we're talking about 10%, 10%. We're talking about 20% adjustment on a uh, hundred. Uh, hundred thousand dollars. You know, now we're up at that one twenty, one twenty five. Uh, that 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 number again. Okay, so now I'm starting to see that number um, pop up. You you compare that to the condition of the uh, one that we found that had been redone, and we're talking about um, you know, that one being one sixty. So if we say the condition is another twenty uh, percent adjustment here, um, you know, let's say that um. You know, it might be even a little bit higher because the, the the price of these are are a little bit lower, so it might take a little bit more to get them there. Uh, let's say it's like a thirty thousand dollar rehab. Uh, now you're at one fifty, right? So from one twenty, you add a thirty thousand dollar rehab. You're you're talking about uh, one fifty. So my ARV in my head, okay. So, so you start you're starting to see these consistencies in this data. So now I'm starting to say, okay, okay, I like this at 150. I think that uh, 150, 160 is a reasonable uh, number to assume. Okay, also this one smaller square footage. You know, I'm not really, I'm not really overly concerned with these. And the more you get into doing this, the easier it is for you to see uh, kind of these little things, and you kind of do them in your head. At first, you know, I had to do them out. And it took me, a, it took me a long time to start to be able to do this quickly kind of do it in my head. It's just, it's do, do repetition. Even if it's not, um, even if it's not, um, the deal you're looking at because you want to buy it, just go on and do, and just do some tech, like just pick an address and try to do it right for the experience. Right. I was doing, I was wake up and do, you know, a couple before, you know, after, right after breakfast, I just do two or three of these and try to, um, you know, get better at this. But this one sold around the, the same time this sold uh, here. You know, you're looking at the matrix um, and I can kind of assume, you know, this might this might have an ARB 150, 160 again. So I think 160 uh, might be the uh, the top of the market here. So I would I would put the ARB at 160. If you want to be conservative about it, um, you could say 150. I like to be conservative and, and say my ARV is always going to be uh, a little bit lower, maybe, you know, five to 10 percent lower. Um, then, then what I'm thinking, um, it might be, um, and some people, you know, won't do that because they want to be really specific and make sure they're getting their deal, um, getting the highest offer they can in, but I'm a conservative guy. I only like to do a couple deals. Uh, I'd rather do less deals that I know are going to work than a bunch of deals and have, have a bunch of them fail. So, um, I don't know if anybody, so I guess David has a, a question here. Sure. Just real quick. All those houses were, um, the back of the property was on an alley. Some of them have garages. Some of them don't have garages. They just have a parking mm -hmm. pad. And I didn't see it on Jamil's um, underwriting. What's the difference when you're talking about adding a garage versus just having 
I mean, there's parking there, but it's just at the back of the property. And so if, mm -hmm. if you're looking at having a, you know, a garage versus no garage, what's that value on that? Did, did you typically add yeah. to that? Um, so actually I do see it on these uh, appraisal rules and it's actually what I agree with is that a garage is uh, around a 10 K as an adjustment. Okay. Um, that's, that's like, usually I'll do per, uh, car, car space. So if it's a two car garage, I might do 15 or 20 K. If it's a one car garage, I might do 10 K. Um, and then also know your market. So a lot of this comes down to, you have to know your market. Uh, you have to be familiar with your market, but some of these smaller adjustments matter less. Um, but if you're talking about Boston, um, I saw a, a parking lot sell for, actually, can anybody guess? Somebody guess what, what parking, parking spot in Boston sold? I'd Probably say half a million dollars. Easily. How much? Half, half a million. million. Yeah. 500,000. So 500,000 spot on. It was, it was, uh, right in the uh, back bay. So that it's just like, you got to know your market. If you're talking about uh, like a place like Cambridge, super cramped, um, not a lot of parking, you got to get permits. If there's a house with a, uh, even, even like an off street, uh, driveway, that's a huge, huge, uh, thing that people are looking for, um, in a place like that. So just kind of things that you have to be aware of, um, when you're thinking about comping are these kind of like micro adjustments that you might have to, uh, change or know about. Uh, when you're talking about a specific market. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, I don't know if anybody else has another question about that. Very, very detail oriented, my friend. Brother, man, you just freaking killed it. I was going to ask you earlier, what particular types of software do you use? And of course you mentioned Zillow and Redfin. Are there any mm -hmm. others? I mean, I hear about Privy and PropStream and things like mm -hmm. those. Yeah, I've never used Privy. I've heard it's good. Uh, it's probably great. Uh, I do have PropStream. When I'm looking at properties in Massachusetts, I use MLS. Um, uh, my father's my uh, broker, and I, I'm uh, getting my license at the end of this month. Um, so that is the best if you have access to it. There are some third-party sites that uh, give access to um, transactions that didn't uh, that didn't happen on market. Like I use real estate record search, which is uh, specific to, I think, New England. Um, but there might be similar, uh, like you can look up the Warren group. Uh, they might have some more nationwide stuff. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but trying to find uh, some good uh, properties because when, when I get into the uh, appraisal side of things, I don't know how uh, long, you know, we're getting in. I can talk about this for a while, but I know we, uh, we, we, we got to uh, be succinct here. Um, but when I'm talking about my appraisal stuff, I like to get it from two sources. So I have a really broad data set so I can start to uh, kind of uh, break it down from there. If we want, I can just, I'm not going to get into the weeds on it, but I can just go through, I'll show, show my spreadsheet. I can share the spreadsheet with everybody um, sure. on, on the appraisal thing. I'm not going to get, I won't, I won't go too detailed on it, but we can just run through it real quick. I can say, yeah. I can show you, you know, how much more detailed it is. So this is this is a um, an opinion of value that I did for a lending deal uh, a few months ago, um, and uh, this is kind of the basic. This is my subject profile uh, page where I kind of get all the information out um, and and look at some of the stuff that's going on here. So what I like to do is I like to grab my Redfin data. Um, so that's the uh, month over month data. I will usually throw that um, in the um in the back here so you see i have a redfin tab i'll just export that data and throw it in here so i can start to see um some of these uh averages and medians where on the uh month over month uh sale price as well as the month over month sale price uh the uh, median year over year and the median sale price month over month as a percentage change and i'll go back as far as the oldest comp so that's kind of how i'd like to do that uh, I'll grab that, export that, and throw it in here. So now I can start to see that month over month over the previous uh, two to three years has been about 2%. So if I'm going to make an assumption about the uh, the uh, time, the the uh, price change, then that 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 gives me an accurate number. Um, the other thing is I'm going to grab some screen caps, maybe of the, uh, maybe of the uh, GIS. GIS is a great resource. Uh, it will direct you to the property card. 
property cards or something I want to talk about a little bit. Um, you know, you want to get the most accurate information. This is what I was talking about earlier was you want to find the, uh, the information from the municipality from the property card. Uh, a lot of times you can do that by accessing the GIS, finding the location. It'll give you information. If you can't, just Google the assessors uh, of the municipality and you're going to go ahead and uh, look for the property card database. You can even Google property card database, assessors database. Any of these things are going to produce, um, you know, your property cards um, and you search the address. You want to you want to look and see if they have a breakdown of the square footage, because what you're looking for is the uh, the GLA. So the gross uh, living area, you don't want to look for the entire square footage of the property because you can have a 5000 square foot property. But if, you know, 50 percent of that is outdoor, th uh, you know, three season uh um, you know, decks and, and, and screened off porches, then that's not really living space. It's not heated. There's no, uh, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, living in that area. Then that, that property is only valued based on the, uh, the gross living area. So it's just something that you want to be uh, mindful of. A lot of times realtors will, um, you know, I don't know if they're doing it on purpose, but they might make a mistake and they just throw a bigger number on there. Um, so, you know, I've had, a, I actually had this happen to me recently. I was on writing a deal that came to me through my uh, agent outreach. The agent approached me saying that the uh, property was 5,000 square feet. I checked the property card uh, and it was 5,000 square feet um, as a whole where there was, um, you know, 3,000 square feet that was, that was actually, um, you know, gross living area. So the ARV went from about 1.4 million to about uh, like, 1 million, maybe even a little bit lower. So it's massive, massive, massive difference that you should always just double check. Um, and that's, if anything, if you're going to look into anything, uh, that is a huge thing to, to be aware of. So that's the property card. As you can see, that's what I like to pull. Photos, uh, maybe it's just from Zillow. Okay. So a lot of times the photos just come from Zillow um, or Redfin or, um, you know, wherever I can get them. If I can get recent photos from the uh, owner and wholesaler, um, then that's going to be the best. I want the most recent stuff. I, the more pictures, the better. If you can get videos. That's awesome. Uh, I really want to have as much information as I can about the uh, interior to start making uh, condition uh, uh, condition adjustments. Uh, then I'm going to grab the map. This is so I can get the yeah buttons. I can start to understand the location. I can see, okay, maybe it's waterfront. Okay, maybe that, that's fantastic. This is going to be a positive um uh, adjustment right so these these kind of things i'm also going to go look at the rents okay even if i'm flipping i'm going to probably grab the rents because i want to have that redundancy right so what happens if i have to hold this uh what happens if i have to hold this is is something is there another layer there okay even if there's not it doesn't mean the deal is dead but it's just something to be aware of uh and it's a great way to talk to lenders if you have that layer of redundancy it's like hey you know if if in a horrible situation, this, you know, this happens, there is another layer there that's going to be able to protect us and protect your money. And then I'm going to check the zoning because I want to consider something about like, uh, is this the highest and best use of this property? So when I talk about the highest and best use of this property is like, okay, maybe this is a, uh, uh, a, a three family. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this is better suited as condominiums. So maybe I do a condominium conversion. I don't have to do any repairs to the property and I can increase the value by a hundred thousand by just, uh, by just doing a condominium conversion. So, um, you know, is that allowed within the zone or if I want to do a new build, right. But I'm, I'm looking at plot of land, but it says that, um, you know, only single families are allowed here, but the deal only makes sense as a three family. I can't, you know, unless I get some special variants, I'm not going to be able to build that. That's a whole different ballgame, right? So fighting fighting the town on on zoning is an entirely separate thing. So I want to just want to make sure that my zoning is what I think it is. So I'm not, uh, you know, buying a, a deal and then getting shut down by the town and them saying you can't do that. Here. So that's another thing that I look at. You can check out the zoning map. Sometimes I take a screenshot of the zoning map. Um, and kind of go in there. So this is the uh, comp search data. These are the kind of the, this is the matrix I was talking about. 
Um, these are the things that I consider the most when looking for comps. And then from here, what I do is I grab uh, some, one, sometimes two sources of data, it depends on the, uh, the area. If I have access to more data, I'm gonna use it. If I don't, I might just default prop stream because um, it's the easiest to export. It's kind of harder to export Zillow. Um, but this, I'm just gonna grab a huge raw snapshot of the entire market. And then from there, I'm gonna clean it up so that it gets into a format that I like where I can see very clearly my street, my city, my sale date, price, land area, GLA, matrix, year built. So from the GLA and the uh, land area, I can also make these uh, derivatives here of the price per square foot of land, and price per square foot of GLA. These become very, very important later down the line. So from here, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for uh, sales considered. So I'm gonna disqualify as many as I can to get to deals that might potentially be comparable, okay? So we're not even at the comps yet. So we're at deals that might potentially be comps that you could uh, you know, consider as uh, things that, that, that would be um, close to comps, but maybe there's, you know, maybe you wanna get a little bit more specified. This list might be 15 or 20, and you just wanna pick the top three to five. Um, but this is, th this ended up being only five. So these do actually end up being my comps, even though there's uh, they're also the sales considered. But from here, I also start to see um, some indicators of value. So what I'm looking throughout this entire thing is I'm looking for indicators of value. And what I want is to see a bunch of indicators of value, right? So when I start to stack these indicators on top of each other, they all start to point in the same direction. If I start to see some dissonance between my indicators, then I'm start questioning what's going on with uh, with my number and why is it not adding up? And I can start to go back and see what's going on, see if something's wrong is is uh, that I messed up or or maybe I'm I'm missing something. So from here, I'm going to select my comps. They, like I said, they end up being the same things here, uh, and I start to get my uh, my um, my matrix. So from here, what I want to pay attention to is the, uh, the 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 min and the max, and then the average and the median. Okay. So from here, now we know the absorption of the market is not going to go over two million, but we also see um, you know the median and the and the average are uh, dramatically lower than that. Um, and a property is probably not going to sell for less than uh, eight hundred seventy five thousand dollars in this market for uh, comparable to the sub. The other thing I want to check out is the uh, price per square foot uh, of GLA. So from here, this is important because this is where I derive my, uh, my, my square footage adjustment from. And what I typically do is somewhere between a third to one half. And it's kind of a judgment call based on the market. And if I think the market is nicer, I might go a little bit higher. If I think the market is a little bit cheaper, um, I'm going to go a little bit lower. So these start to come into play when we get to a buy adjustment. Table. I'm happy to share this with anybody. Uh, I'm happy to uh, work with people. Um, this gets a little bit more into the weeds. I'm not going to uh, talk ad nauseum about this. I'm going to run through it real quick. Um, but what, what happens here is these populate, the comps populate here, and I'm just going to go line by line down this. I'm going to make my adjustments. I'm going to use different techniques and strategies to make sure that I'm kind of in line with what I'm thinking about to make sure that I'm getting to uh, a good adjusted number down here. So what I do is sales price, the sales uh, price per square foot, my uh, time, uh, the time of sale, as well as the, uh, the adjustment for that. And those are what I call my above the line adjustments. So the above the line adjustments are the location as well as the, uh, the sale date. So these things impact the, uh, the uh, adjustment because you want to make you want to make your subsequent adjustments to the price after these adjustments. So what happens here? So there's a there's a about a ten thousand dollar adjustment on my nine hundred and sixty five thousand dollar sale price here. Um, I get a nine hundred seventy four thousand dollar adjusted line total. I'm going to adjust the 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 next uh, segment to to this price, which is which is different from this price. So this is an important factor um, that that um, I I look at that a lot of people don't look at. Um, but I think that's very important to consider that kind of thing. 
location. Uh, this is like if you're like right on like a, a country club or maybe, you know, you're you have a, a, a something very, very good about the location or the location perhaps is in a different town. If you're dealing with a place that has uh, very, very limited data, the first appraisal I ever did was in Great Barrington. Um, and there was one sale in the last two years. So I had to use four towns around it. And I had to make adjustments based on, um, you know, Redfin data telling me that the, the difference between the location and the town. So that's a huge, that's a huge component that you want to adjust for before making these other adjustments. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at the view. Is there maybe an ocean view, lake view, uh, a nice skyline? You know, is there anything here that I want to consider? Um, the age. This um, is something that I like to work with. In New England, this matters a little bit less uh, because the properties are so old that uh, it's it's actually not it's not as big of a deal. When you're looking at a place that uh, like maybe like Arizona or something, uh, you want to stay within like ten years of the uh, subject property. But if I'm looking, you know, I kind of like to keep this broad um, in general, and I'm not actually going to make an adjustment based off this. But I just want to have it here because I want to know, like, all right, later down the line, if this is 50 years difference and there's a there's a big price difference, that could be the reason why. So I might weight this one a little bit less down the line. Then from the condition, you can see I have my uh, my scale here. You you can start to see that <clears throat> I scale things on a on a scale from one to six, uh, with plus and minus in between. So uh, C one. It, a C1 is going to be a brand new property. It's a new build. Uh, a C6 is like, um, uh, like you're not going to see C6, right? That's that's a dilapidated, destroyed, falling apart, rotting, holes in the roof, like like bad, 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 bad property. Okay, that's rare. Um, C3 is rental grade. So is it livable? Um, it needs updating, but it is... You could put it on uh, Craigslist right now and, and get a renter. Um, C4, you start to lose the livability factor, um, but it's not a hazard to walk into, right? You might have to, um, you know, plug your nose because it smells bad, but it's not like the roof is going to fall on you and you're going to fall through the deck. Um, so that's just kind of, uh, you know, and then I have the plus and minus here through on the C C5 through C2. Um, so it just gives a little bit more, um, of a specificity there. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll do a percentage of the, um, uh, of the, uh, adjusted. So for example, if this, let's say that this was a, a C2 property, okay. Or C2, yeah, C2 condition. So this is a little bit of a judgment call. You kind of have to massage this. If you, the better you are at knowing construction, the easier this becomes, um, but for me, I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in uh, rehab costs. So this is kind of how I do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and take this. I'm going to throw this on here. C2 to C3. I'm going to say that's probably like a, maybe like a 10%, maybe 15. Depends on the property. Um, but I'm going to give you a trick to, to tell you like uh, how I think about this as well. Um, so I'm going to say that this is a 10%. The, the comparable is nicer than the subject so i want the comparable to to match the subject so i want to make it i want to make a negative adjustment so because the property is nicer i want to take away from it to know and this is to, to get your arv this is not to get your arv this is to get your as is value to get from rental grade to re renovated how much money would it take Right. Let's say I need a new bathroom. I need a new kitchen. I need new flooring. Maybe I need new siding. How much is that going to cost? Right. And uh, this came back at 100,000. So new kitchen, new bathroom. All right. So like 40,000 in my market, you know, 40, 50,000, a bathroom, 15. So now we're at 65. Siding, maybe 10. Okay. So now we're at, you know, 75. Uh, I think this is starting to look pretty accurate. Okay. So that's kind of how I think about that. Uh, does this number look like what it might take to get this property to this property? Uh, that's kind of how I think about that uh, condition-wise. 
And then from here in the matrix, I'm actually not adjusting based on uh, bedrooms at all. I'm, bit, I'm, 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 I will only look at the uh, square footage of the property because that's the potential of it, right? So maybe I can add a, a bedroom. Uh, maybe I can, uh, you know, make some, some, some changes in the, in the, uh, in the property. Um, so I'm only going to look at the, uh, the bathroom count to make an actual adjustment on the count. The square footage is going to capture the bedroom count uh, in my matrix. So the the adjustment for the square footage is going to uh, be the thing that I look at uh, instead of bedrooms. For bathrooms, like 10, 15K for a bathroom, for a half bath, half that. Um, and then you start to get into stuff like, is there a finished basement? Uh, finished basement, basement, you want to check this in your GLA because sometimes people will include the uh, finished basement space in GLA uh, on like Zillow or MLS or something like that. But in reality, it's about only half the value of above grade GLA. So if this is my number of, of uh, GLA above grade, uh, let's say there's like, you know, 100,000 um, square feet of, of uh, basement space, I'm going to only give that, let's say, okay, so let's go back for a second. And we saw that, um, you know, we're about, you know, 400 is kind of 300, 400 is where we're at. I think that this market is is going to be uh, two hundred dollars per square foot, right? So I think my my adjustment for a basement is going to be about a hundred dollars. Okay, so that's kind of how I think about that. The square foot adjustment, I just kind of explained where that came from. You subtract um, here, and and that's how you get that. You multiply it by the uh, the square foot adjustment that you derive from that matrix from before, and then what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with um, a gross uh, or a net adjustment on on the on the comparable. So this is important to to understand because if there is a huge number here, you want to pay less attention to it when you're making your value determination. So as you can see, there's one hundred eighty-seven thousand dollar a, a net adjustment here. So that's pretty big. Whereas this one only has eleven thousand. So that's one thing that I want to consider when I'm weighting the. The, the the value and making a determination on the uh, on the end on the end but that's only one thing to consider right so maybe this property is is way closer maybe it's super comparable maybe it's sold only a month ago right whereas this one sold a year ago um, you know it there was a there was a major positive adjustment and there was a major negative adjustment it may look like there wasn't a bunch of adjustments going on but realistically, this, there was a lot. There was a lot going on here uh, that I have to consider. So maybe this one is actually a little bit more um, uh, weighted than than that other. One. So what I'm going to end up with here is um, a range of of two numbers. So I'm going to end up with a range of the adjusted price per square foot, and as well as the. Uh, range of the adjusted price per square foot of GLA. Uh, this is the adjusted sales price, my bad. So the adjust the range of the adjusted sales price and the range of the adjusted price per square foot of GLA. So why it's important to have both of these is because when I go to check the value, um, if, the, if the value I want, so this is one of the value indicators I was talking about, is I want my AR, I want my uh, opinion of value to fall within this range. So I want my opinion of value to fall within this range, but it it can it could very well be that the opinion of value for the as is price or ARV falls within the adjusted uh, price range, but when you go to do the price per square foot, this this may not fall within this range, and you can actually see that this is happening. In this in this example, right? So this is two ninety one price per square foot, whereas the the smallest price per square foot in my range here is two ninety five. So that tells me that I might want to drive this up so that I can get within this range a little bit more. But the reason why I'm okay with this is because this is pretty close, and some of the other things that I considered throughout this process tell me that. You know, okay. I don't think that th there's only there's only 
one comp that's at 2 million and one that's over, you know, one point, the 1.1 1 .1 area. So I don't want to go, I don't want to go too much higher than that. Um, so I, this is kind of like, they're kind of pushing on each other. And that's why I feel kind of confident that this is, this is where it should be. So that's kind of how I get, that's kind of how I get to um, my opinion of value. Um, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into it. I could talk about this for probably hours and hours and hours. Um, but that's the overview. I, I'm more than happy to uh, work with people to uh, help them through this. Uh, if if you're working with a lender, this is this. If you show a lender this and you and you explain every part of it, you will get the, you will you'll have no problem with that lender. I have amazing testimonials from deals that I've done with with lenders because I was able to talk them through this process and I was uh, openly communicating the entire time. So this is the kind of stuff that they love. If you're working on a deal that needs a lender, or if you just want that extra layer of protection for yourself, um, I'll, I'll do this. If I'm, if I'm, you know, if I have an offer in a property, if the property's under contract, I'm in an inspection period. Uh, I want to dig deeper into it make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. And then, you know, if it's a multifamily property, there's a whole other uh, thing that you can do. And another uh, value indicator that you can look for is the uh, income approach. I think this is probably for another video. Um, but basically, you can come to a, a conclusion using the cap rate um, to figure out what, you know, what would this what would this property go for uh, based on the cap rate of the market? There's a strategy you can use to kind of derive that as well. Um, but then you have two va you have two uh, value indicators from the uh, comparable approach and as well as your income approach. And then you can kind of reconcile those to say, are these close? If they're not, why not? Um, and if they are, that's a strong value indicator that you're pretty spot on. So uh, this was a 1.2. Um, my comparable approach came in at 1.1. You probably argue that this could go for a little bit more uh 1.15 maybe 1.2 uh seeing as that that that's around where some of these comps are um so this is so this is what i'm talking about with with our funnel you know we start out with this massive uh data set and we get it down to this these five and we're arguing really specific with them um and then now this is this is when we can apply our opinion Right. Where, where does, where, if with all I know about this property, where does, where does my opinion fall in this, uh, in this range? Right. Do I think that my subject property is the best, uh, of, of all these comps? It's as good as, as the best comp. Where do I think it's on the, on the lower scale of things? I have to be realistic with myself when I'm, when I'm talking about that. Um, when I'm thinking about that, I have to try to remain unbiased. Can't be looking for a number. Um, I have to be trying to find a number. So that's kind of where I'm at uh, with with that stuff. Uh, the other thing I would probably do is, you know, just quick like exit breakdown, uh, looking for redundancy. What am I trying to do with the deal? Is there a lender in the deal? What are the costs of things um, and, and, and all of that? So that's another, you know, that's a whole other thing that we can uh, talk about another time. But brother, I think people are predominantly taking some notes. Because you're you're covering you were throwing down some serious gold nuggets, going into detail, um, you know, giving us some specifics that that are invaluable. So um, I think probably what's going to happen is people are going to be reviewing this video on, on the YouTube channel, and um, and of course, as always, we'll, we'll ask you after the call the best way to to, to reach out to you. Uh, so that you know, in case anyone you know, whether they're on the call now or they're they're uh, watching weeks and months down the line, they're going to be like, "Wow, you know, there's some, you know, how do I follow up with this guy?" Mm -hmm. So uh, now, Matt, you you shared some unbelievably valuable information, great insight, uh, things that probably you know, not probably a lot of new investors just don't think about or have the cognizant awareness. You know, so it's there's a, a common phrase, we don't know what we don't know. And uh, you just touched on a lot of stuff that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, great value. I want to thank you so much for, uh, for, for coming on. 
Yeah, no, JJ, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to uh, come on here and talk about this stuff. I want to share this information because I want to make sure people who are working so hard to get their money uh, keep it safe and are making good decisions. So I, I definitely appreciate the platform to be able to do that. Uh, always is a great time talking to you. So uh, definitely appreciate uh, being able to come on here. Well, brother, I think you killed it. And I think I think one thing we might want to do is help you get your own YouTube channel and start doing your own instructional stuff. And, of course, we'll have you back to speak for us again. But you've got so Absolutely. much value that I don't, I think, you know, and I, I, I you know, I, I, Pace said it about me. I've got so much stuff that I can offer. But, you know, now I have a YouTube channel. Now I can start to put it out there because mm -hmm. as I'm starting to put it out there, it, it kind of amazes me of how much I have to share. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he's like, put something in the vault. Well, let me let me get it down on paper first. And there's just so much. As I'm sure with you, it's the same thing. There's so much. All right. I could, I could talk ad nauseum, I, you know. So it's definitely uh, something I like to do. I, I coach wrestling. So I like to, you know, help people learn things uh, and, and kind of work through stuff. So uh, love to do it. And, uh, you know, it's just the beginning. Yeah, no, again, thank you so much. Hey, brother, I got two last questions for you. Um, one, let me see if I've got it here. If people want to reach out to you, um, what's the best way to do that? Would it be your MySpace, your TikTok, your, you know, since you're single, is it your Match.com account? What's the best way to reach out to you? Um, so the best way to reach out to me is definitely Facebook. Um, I do have Instagram. You can follow me, but I'm not really uh, on there for work uh, as much as I should be. Uh, but if you want, uh, you can find me on Facebook, reach out to me. I'm very responsive uh, and we can and we can make stuff happen. If you need if you need uh, help with lenders, talking to lenders, more than happy to uh, talk with you about that um, or if and, you're looking for a deal for yourself. Um, and you, and you and do yeah. have Instagram as well, correct? I do have Instagram. Uh, you can check it out. You can follow me. Uh, it's a little bit more of my personal life, but you can feel free to check it out. You see me in pace there. Yeah, you, this guy looks guy on the left looks familiar. Yes, sir. There you go. So, uh, yeah, no, and as and uh, as always, as you said, you're a coach, you're an athlete, you're you know, given the of course, this is a standard photo with you surrounded by beautiful girls, but uh, that's what you get for being an athlete, all right? Kind of kind of comes with the territory. It does. Hey, sometimes. So, um, so that is the best way to reach you would be your Facebook page, um. Mm -hmm. I got one last question for you. You know, we're you're a very successful investor, a successful entrepreneur, and we're both in Sub Two. That's how we met. There are many education groups out there, such as Sub Two, Astro Flipping, Thrive, Clever Investor, Seven Figure Flipping. There's like there's a gazillion of them. Uh, each of these programs have brand new investors coming every day. Some are experienced, some are very inexperienced, but they've got brand new people coming to these education platforms every single day, looking to get the education on the topic at hand. And a lot of people just aren't really looking to leverage social media to build their business, meaning posting, mm -hmm. commenting, making themselves visible, networking. In your opinion, as an experienced investor, and you're dealing with a ton of people across the country, what is the importance to the investor today, new or inexperienced or experienced? What is the importance, say, of of networking and, uh, mm -hmm. to the success of someone's business? Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, it's it's a couple things. So, a a sense of community because I want to feel like I'm contributing to something. Uh, I'm not just in it for the money. I want to build something. I want to do that with other people. Um, and, and the the being included in, with with like minded people uh, is is absolutely key to my motivation and and, and what I want to and, and how I'm looking at stuff. Uh, the other thing is um, perspective. So I'm I'm gaining new perspective all the time by talking to new people when my network grows, like I, I'm, I'm gaining new skills. I have access to more people, uh, who, who are, or better at things than me, than I am. And, you know, when maybe, maybe I can link two people like you, like you do JJ, right? Like I can say like, Oh, like these, these two have the, the things that, that each other need. 
Um, and you know, by doing that, they remember me and they'll, 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 uh, help me out when I need it. Um, so it's just absolutely grateful. You, you can't do this without networking. You can't. Yeah, no, that's, that's so true. You know, I, I myself have a networking group and, uh, and you've seen a little bit about what we do. Um, what is the importance to the new investor or experienced investor in joining a networking group like mine? So in joining your group where you have a very personal approach, um, it can, it gives that sense of community, right? Like you're not afraid to ask the the question uh, that you feel like uh, might be dumb, right? Because it's not, it's, yeah. it's a question that, that so many people have had and you want to, you want to just keep asking those questions. You want to keep learning more. Uh, that's why I like real estate is because it's endlessly learning. Um, and being able to be in a group like yours, where there's that level of uh, comfort, and I know that people are looking out for me, um, that's where it gets, you know, it's, it can be special because I don't have to be worried um, that somebody's going to feed me the bad information. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have to be worried about somebody's going to you know, do bad things. And, and uh, there's always bad apples out there, but by, oh, having, yeah. this personal, by having this personal approach, um, it helps to mitigate that that stuff yeah thank you so much hey brother i really appreciate you being on you're a friggin' rock star drop some serious gold nuggets and um just can't say how much i appreciate you looking forward to you and i catching up more in person um hey, if you guys are watching on youtube right now please like ryan's video please put in the comment section what your takeaways were what you found most valuable um if you have comments on how i can improve what i'm doing how we can improve our show, our, our, our podcast, maybe any guests you want to see come up in the future. Uh, would love to get your input. Again, if you want to connect with Ryan, you can find him on Facebook and let's see, we'll share his, his uh, page again here really quick. If you want to connect with myself uh, and join my networking group, just, just click this QR code up here. Uh, that takes you to my website. You hit the register now button. You can register for the networking group. Over here, you've got my Instagram handle, uh, jj.azizian. And again, that's the website address for my webpage. But, um, you know, come back and join us. Look for more great videos and great value coming out from Flipside with JJ. We have more great guest speakers coming. Not as good as Ryan Erico, but, you know, when you set the bar high, you're just always trying to get, get up there again. Um, if you're on the call right now, guys, don't go away. We're going to do some live networking and get acquainted and, and chat with, with Ryan a little bit more. Ryan, brother, thank you so much. Really appreciate you.